Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I am Justin White, a tobacco control researcher at University of California, San Francisco. Tops is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, and Mike Pesco from Georgia State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Christopher Kit Carpenter will lead a traditional single paper presentation entitled Intended and Unintended Effects of Banning Menthol Cigarettes. Kit is the E. Bronson Ingram Professor of Economics at Vanderbilt University, where he also holds appointments in the schools of education, law, and medicine, and directs the program in public policy studies in the Vanderbilt LGBT Policy Lab. Outside of Vanderbilt, Kit is the director of the Health Economics Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research, editor at the Journal of Health Economics, co-chair of the American Economic Association's Committee on the Status of LGBTQ plus individuals in the economics profession, a member of the National Advisory Council of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. His tobacco policy research has examined the effects of clean indoor air loss in Canada and the effects of cigarette taxes on smoking among youths and sexual minorities in the United States. Hi Nijin is a co-author of the paper and will assist in answering select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Dr. Ian Irvine from Concordia University in Montreal. Dr. Carpenter will be presenting his research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Carpenter, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you, uh, Mike, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Justin and Catherine and C for um, uh, inviting us for this um, opportunity and for running this entire series, which has been really helpful and I've learned a lot. Um, my slides are up and I'm gonna uh, go through them. So if you see any technical difficulties, Mike, please just uh, turn your video back on and let me know. Um, so uh, Hi is here, as Mike said, uh, and we'll be helping to answer questions in the Q&A. So please um, uh, be liberal with your uh, questions and, and we'll try to get them answered. Um, this is a project looking at the intended and unintended effects of banning menthol cigarettes, uh, which is very topical right now. And in terms of disclaimers and disclosures, this paper is forthcoming in the Journal of Law and Economics. The most recent pre-publication version is available at the NBER website. Um, today, if you're already familiar with the pre-publication version, we will um, uh, keep it interesting by showing you uh, analyses with more after uh, data. Um, and let me say that our study received no external funding. We have no disclosures to report. Uh, we can direct you on how to obtain data and the replication kit for this paper will be posted uh, just as soon as our page proofs come in um, to the Journal of Law and Economics. So by way of motivation, uh, given this audience, I don't think we need to spend that much time talking about the fact that very recently the FDA announced that they would um, uh, take steps to ban uh, menthol flavoring. Um, in cigarettes and banned flavored cigars. Um, and we have been here before, uh, as recently as November of 2018, when it seemed apparent that the, a similar action was to be taken. Um, and this will give you a, a sense of, excuse me, no pun intended, of the arguments around why we are thinking about, um, why the government is thinking about doing this. Um, then commissioner said, I believe these menthol flavored products represent one of the most common and pernicious routes by which kids initiate uncombustible cigarettes. And that quote is particularly relevant for our study today, a primary contribution of which is we will have survey data on youths uh, and we'll be able to say something about their um, smoking behaviors around uh, uh, imposition of menthol bans. Um, the FDA uh, said that they were adv going to ad advance this notice, um, but after a variety of um, uh, different activities that happened in the interim, including some um, uh, statements from uh, senators on different sides of the aisle, um, as you see here, uh, that ended up not happening. And uh, as we all know, there was a, a change in leadership um, at the FDA. Um, more broadly, however, menthol bans are expanding worldwide. So uh, this has happened in Brazil, in the European Union, in throughout different parts of the United States prior to this most recent announcement um, of uh, a nationwide uh, policy. So the motivation 
for our study when we started this several years ago was to inform North American debates about the possible and likely effects of what would happen if menthol bans were adopted uh, in the United States. And our read of the literature that really motivated our study was when you think about the economics literature and the public health literature, the economics literature uh, has almost nothing on menthol cigarettes, very, very little. Um, but certainly the economists kind of, you know, love to do quasi-experimental evaluations of really interesting things like cigarette tax changes, tobacco 21 policies, etc. In the United States, uh, experiments with menthol related uh, policies are too recent and our data sets really just aren't equipped to answer those questions historically at least in the United States because very few surveys on a large scale ask questions about menthol smoking. Uh, the public health literature in contrast has really um, taken the lead on uh, studying menthol and they have many many studies. Um, uh, there have been fewer but not zero quasi-experimental evaluations um, and I would say that there's very little evidence on youths which is one of the key fo focuses for I of our uh, study today. So we're going to advance uh, this research by like a handful of public health studies studying the experience of Canada, which offers not only data, but also um, policy variation. So this is the policy landscape um, in Canada, whereby provinces, which is the main focus of our study, we're going to look at provincial specific menthol bans in Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, Labrador, Prince Edward Island, uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, which ban menthol cigarettes uh, at different points in time over the recent past prior to the imposition of a federal uh, ban in Canada in 2018. So our analysis is going to, most of our published analysis that's forthcoming will focus on data before 2018, although today I'll also show you a handful of kind of bonus slides that incorporate the more recent data and the punchline is the same. Um, let me be very, very clear about what we think are the main internal and external validity trade-offs with studying Canada as it pertains to thinking about what we might learn in the context of the United States. So the first two things to note are that there are enormous differences between Canada and the US with respect to some aspects of the menthol cigarette market, not the least of which is that the menthol market is much smaller in Canada than it is in the United States. So let's be clear about that fact, as well as this other fact that is well known and well documented in the popular press, which is, and true, which is that there are huge race differences in menthol use in the United States. 88% or something like this of African-Americans uh, smokers prefer menthol versus a much smaller share of whites. And this is just uh, not true in Canada. You do see some disparities, um, but they are not uh, nearly of the magnitude that um, they are in the United States. So we, you know, in that sense, uh, I think there are legitimate external validity questions to be raised uh, about the results that I will show you today. That said, we also want to be clear that we think we can learn quite a bit from uh, some substantial things from Canada, um, not the least of which is that youths are a continued concern uh, in the US, especially with respect to initiation in the context of menthol. Uh, and conditional on smoking youths strongly prefer menthol over uh, traditional um, non-menthol flavored combustible cigarettes. Um, and I will show you later that that is also true in Canada. So there would be reason that we would learn about youths from uh, our study and other studies of Canada. And relatedly, evasion and black market uh, problems are also a concern in the US as they, uh, in part because of the many unregulated sources such as on Native American reservations. And this is also uh, a, a discussion in Canada. So. My point of this slide is just to say we are aware that there are reasons why we might be hesitant uh, to extrapolate too much from the Canadian, ex Canadian experience for learning about the US. And there are some reasons to uh, be hopeful that we would learn something important about uh, the US from the Canadian experience. So let me just show you what we have found um, leveraging the variation across the provinces in the timing of implementation of these um, menthol bans in Canada. So we're going to uh, try to convince you, uh, and we have convinced a journal at least, um, that uh, these bans significantly, they achieved one of, their un one of their intended effects by significantly reducing menthol smoking among youths and adults. So I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures um, today uh, of this variety, which are just going to show you um, uh, the prevalence of use of a variety of outcomes. This is the prevalence of menthol smoking. Um, and these are trends in youth menthol smoking. And each dot here is for a group of provinces that either adopted a menthol ban over this period. And the red line shows you approximately when the bans were adopted. So because of our youth specific data, this is youths, because of our youth specific data, which I will describe later, um, 
uh, we don't have an exact date of interview, so we have to do this kind of every two years kind of thing with the youth specific data. So we know that provincial menthol bans entered around here with the uh, uh, vertical red line. And these dots just show you for provinces that were shaded in that earlier slide, the share of kids in that survey, I think 12 to 17 year olds that uh, report um, menthol smoking. And the red are the associated menthol smoking shares for kids in those provinces that did not adopt provincial bans prior to the federal ban. And what you see here is that, um, and so the point of a contribution of our study is that we are going to be at least able to go back a little bit to look at this uh, issue of differential uh, trends leading up to the adoption of provincial bans. And the main uh, result that you uh, will see that uh, I think jumps off of this page, even just in the raw data, is that um, you know menthol smoking after bans in the for kids in the treated provinces fell. It fell absolutely. It also fell relative to the pre-existing trend for kids in those other provinces that did not adopt provincial menthol bans around the same time period that those highlighted provinces in the previous slide did. So you can see that in when we put this in a difference and differences framework or another framework that's common in economics, the event study framework, where we um, kind of compare the difference between the red dots and the blue dots, the difference between those red dots and the blue dots around the relative timing of those bans, where relative timing of the ban is uh, recentered at time zero, what you see is that um, there was a, and these uh, vertical bars are the 95% confidence intervals. Uh, what you see is that, um, you know, there is not a differential pre-trend at least two years prior to the adoption of the provincial menthol bans. And uh, within two years after, uh, youth menthol smoking is significantly lower. I'm sorry, the scale is not listed here, but I'll, I'll tell you the magnitude uh, when we get to the table. So the punchline of the first result is just menthol bans appeared to have worked. They got kids to smoke menthol, uh, to smoke menthol cigarettes um, less. Um, for the adults, uh, in the data I'll describe a little bit later, we have far less great data on menthol smoking because they only asked the menthol cigarette questions um, in two years, 2015 and 2017. So I'm not, sorry I don't have the vertical line here, but the bans would have happened right in between um, uh, uh, these two surveys. And with the adult data, we do observe the, um, uh, a more, more detailed information on the timing of interview. These are all self-reported surveys, by the way. I'm sorry I did not say that. Um, and so for uh, uh, adults, even though we can't tell you something about the pre-trends in menthol smoking, what we can tell you is just at two points in time and a simple difference in difference, uh, adults in the provinces that adopted menthol bans, you see this um, absolute reduction in menthol smoking, um, whereas in the provinces that did not adopt menthol bans, actually, their menthol smoking actually went up. So in a difference in differences framework, this is also going to suggest a relative reduction for adults in the provinces that adopted menthol bans, coincident with the adoption of those bans, a re relative re reduction that's going to be statistically significant in uh, the probability of menthol smoking. So the first result is menthol bans appear to have worked in the self-reported survey data at reducing menthol smoking, but there is no significant reduction in overall smoking. So this is that same uh, graph for kids, uh, where this is the prevalence of any past 30 day cigarette smoking, not specific to menthol. And what you see here is that, um, you know, these are the pre-trends for the kids in the provinces that were shaded that adopted menthol bans between 2014 and 2016. These are the pre-trends for kids in the provinces that did not adopt those bans. And what you, and again, this is just the raw data. So we're trying to be as hands above the table and showing you the raw data. And what you see here is that unlike the previous graph for menthol smoking, coincident with the adoption of menthol bans, you do not see an actual uh, continued reduction in youth cigarette smoking. And in fact, you see both an absolute and a relative increase in overall uh, modest increase in overall um, um, uh, uh, cigarette smoking. So this is going to end up washing out to no uh, overall change in youth cigarette um, uh, smoking. And the same is going to be true for adults, although with a little bit um, more of a caveat. So for adults, unlike the previous graph where I could only show you menthol smoking for literally two data, two points in time, the advantage of the adult survey for uh, overall smoking is that it goes way back, right? So we have a much longer time series for the adults. And for the adults, what you do see is that the trends across provinces in both the provinces that did adopt those provincial menthol bans prior to the federal ban 
and the trends for in the red for the pro people, adults in the provinces that did not adopt um, those provincial bans prior to the federal ban, you do see basically similar pre-trends leading up to the adoption of the provincial bans. Um, and then you uh, see that there, uh, for some reason, there has been, in, there was in that 2017 uh, period, an increase in adult cigarette smoking in both the treatment group and the control group, i.e. people in the provinces that adopted and people in the provinces that did not. Um, you do see a relatively larger increase in the control than in the uh, treated group. Um, this is not going to turn out to be statistically significant, but of course, um, there is uh, standard errors associated with this, so we don't want to push on that um, too hard. So to square this first result with the second result, um, kind of a big change in, a big reduction in menthol smoking with no apparent overall significant change in overall smoking, we of course want to ask what else was going on. And the two unintended effects that we want to, and thus the title of the paper, the two unintended effects that we want to point out are substitution and evasion. So um, if you've read the paper, you see that uh, our main substitution result is that for kids, again, this is these are raw trends in kids smoking of non-mental cigarettes. Um, what you see here is that for kids in the treated provinces, i.e. the provinces that adopted uh, mental bans, um, there was a increase both absolutely and relatively that is substantially more substantial than what you saw in overall smoking in the previous graph relative to the associated change in trends for the kids in the control provinces that did not adopt uh, provincial mental bans, such that, I'm sorry, I don't have, I thought I had the event study here, such that when you have the um, uh, difference in differences model or the event study, you do see that this turns out to a uh, significant increase in non-mental smoking. So the kids, at least in this cross uh, province cross time difference and differences study that leverages the timing of uh, provincial bans across provinces, you do see that the reduction in youth mental smoking was compensated, substituted for, compensated for uh, by a, an offsetting increase in their non mental smoking, i.e., resulting in what you saw previously, no overall change in the kids' overall smoking. And then for adults, we see a different um, type of unintended, but maybe pre perhaps predictable effect, which is that uh, we find uh, pretty consistent evidence of evasion to First Nations reserves um, in Canada where these policies uh, do not bind. Um, and so here is a, a flavor of the uh, First Nations picture. Again, we have uh, this outcome going, it was asked in various years of the adult survey. We have it going back to 2010. Again, the blue is for adults in the treat treatment provinces, the red in the control provinces. Again, here you see um, reasonably similar pre-trends leading up to the adoption of these provincial bans. And then you see a substantial reduction in uh, First Nations purchasing behavior. We don't know that they're buying menthol specifically in First Nations. Let me be very clear about that. But the probability that the individual reports First Nations purchasing behavior falls substantially for um, uh, people in control provinces and does not fall for people or falls much more modestly for people in the treatment provinces, which will, of course, give rise to this relative significant, and this is going to be statistically significant, this relative increase in First Nations uh, purchasing um, uh, associated with um, the adoption of the bans for adults in those um, provinces. So, you know, this is a good place to stop and, and take questions. Let me, and I'm sorry, I'm, I realize I'm already 15 minutes in. Let, let me just say that, but, but also that's the result of the paper. So this is the most important things to get in. Let me just say that based on these results, and there are others that I can show you, this is going to lead us to conclude that mental bans are likely to have had both intended and unintended consequences, and therefore unlikely to be a panacea for addressing kind of tobacco-related harm. Uh, Mike. Um, there's no questions in the Q&A panel. Um, I, I was just wondering, uh, for the non-treated states, it seemed like there was kind of an, up, uh, an uptick of, in the mental um, use among kids. Um, and then I guess in overall sales as well. I was just wondering, you know, what might account, um, if you have any ideas on, you know, is that just measurement error? Um, or is there some kind of reason why non-treated kids may have used mental more in the post period? Uh, that is a good question. This is the slide you're talking about, yeah? Yes, yeah. Yes. So that is a good question. We had, did not, um, feel, I, I will invite Hai to uh, jump in here if he has more ideas. So what I can tell you is that our models are going to control for all range of other provincial specific policies that are going on. And of course, other national shocks will be accounted for through year specific fixed effects in our regression models. So it's not other, it's not changes, it's not differences in real cigarette prices, I can tell you. It's not differences in other youth specific policies towards e-cigarettes, for example, I can tell you. Um, 
Um, uh, but we didn't, we, we are kind of leaning on the design here and have did not kind of more investigate sub substantively what might be responsible for that uptick if in fact it is not just noise. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good question. Okay. Um, a number of questions, but why don't you just go ahead and proceed and sure. then we'll, we'll pause that then. Uh, if any of these are unresolved um, by uh, your co-author, then we can address those Great. Um, at the next pause. Great. So um, uh, this is also a slide that I don't need to spend too much time on given this audience, but menthol is a flavoring agent. It tastes like mint. It has a cooling effect. It also has physiological effect for smokers to reduce the harshness and irritation of smoking, reinforce the sensory stimulation. It changes the fundamental structure of nicotine receptors. Um, these concerns lead us uh, and public health advocates to think um, that menthol smoking is both easier to start and harder to quit, um, including one of the most prominent um, public health uh, uh, leaders in the United States in 2019, our former U.S. Surgeon General, who tweeted, all cigarettes are deadly, but menthol ones are particularly insidious because menthol flavor makes masks the harshness of smoke, making it easier to tolerate, especially for new smokers. This has been shown to increase smoking initiation, progression, and make quitting harder. So this is the fundamental idea behind why folks want to uh, ban menthol cigarettes. And if that is true, then banning menthol cigarettes should reduce initiation. It should increase quits. It should reduce smoking rates in the medium to longer run. Um, the, there is quite a bit of literature, as I said, in public health on the topic of menthol. So there's a, a bunch of studies that do very interesting things where they ask uh, current smokers, like, what would you do if your product was no longer available? Um, and so uh, that's one flavor of study. Another kind of study is, um, and we've seen, probably seen some of these in the top seminar, is to perform discrete choice experiments with uh, different flavor attributes uh, with menthol smokers. I think the closest to our work are a handful of prior studies and contemporaneous studies that looked at the specific experience of Canada, including, I want to highlight these last two, which were contemporaneous to our study um, and which we will certainly incorporate in our references um, before the paper gets published. So um, uh, uh, this Chaitan et al. paper looks um, at the experience of Ontario and looks at uh, longitudinal data for people who were menthol smokers and people who were non-menthol smokers before and after Ontario's province-specific menthol ban, and they find evidence of more quits um, uh, associated with banning menthol uh, for the menthol, the people who were smoking menthol uh, in the pre-period. Uh, there's also this uh, Chung Hall study, which is complementary to ours, um, which looks at the, uh, I think that's the International Tobacco Control for Country Survey, which includes Canada, so they can look at um, Canadian adults in a longitudinal framework, um, and they can look at the experiences of 138 menthol smokers in the pre-period, and then um, see what changed relative to the timing of provincial menthol bans, and they find substitution to non-menthol cigarettes. They also find more quits, similar to the Chaitan study, uh, although, again, nationwide in Canada, and they also find more First Nations reserve purchasing um, uh, for those uh, people who are smoking menthol in the free period. So our study, I would say, is most closely related to these two. And if you think about what's different and new about ours, uh, those other studies are primarily about adults. So our focus on use is, is quite new. Uh, we are going to show you longer pretrends, which is, I think, just a disciplinary difference. Um, and then we're also going to complement uh, those results with sales data, which, by the way, uh, also sales data was shown in the, uh, this, 2000, this earlier JTON et al. study. Uh, we're going to have sales data for the entire country uh, to show you, not surprisingly, that menthol sales fall sharply coincident with the uh, imposition of menthol bans. In economics, uh, we've done a lot less work on menthol. So Don Kinkle has some uh, very nice work on the effects of magazine advertising for uh, uh, menthol. Chuck and Mike and co-authors have this very interesting paper on 2009 uh, federal policy that banned um, non-menthol flavors in cigarettes. Um, no studies that I am aware of, although if there are, please disabuse me uh, of that notion, uh, on U.S. specific menthol bans in part because of lack of data and very recent variation. Although um, uh, Don and Jason Somerville, I think, have a project in progress um, on the experiences of bans on flavored cigars. Um, I will say that there's lots of uh, previous literature and economics about thinking just generally about what might be some unintended consequences of uh, st stricter tobacco regulations. And these are just four examples, but uh, this ranges the gamut from, you know, it might induce higher cigarette taxes, might induce uh, people to smoke uh, uh, har harsher cigarettes, for example. Uh, it might uh, induce people to smoke their cigarettes more intensely. Lots of things that um, we need to think about um, in terms of um, compensating behavior by people. Um, so in, in terms of the policy landscape, the Canadian tobacco control landscape, there was a 2010 federal ban uh, on all flavors except menthol, similar to what happened in the United States in 2009. Uh, menthol and other flavoring was available uh, in e-cigarettes uh, as well over this time period. Um, and then prior to menthol bans, provinces adopted minimum purchase ages, and we control for minimum purchase ages throughout. 
Um, the data underlying the raw data that I just showed you are these Canadian Student Tobacco and Drug Survey and the adult version of that survey uh, called the CTADS. Um, uh, the CS the CS TADS asks about mental use every year since 2010, um, but the adult version only asks in those two years, which is a, a challenge for us. But the big advantage that we think here is that we have much larger sample sizes than are common in the public health studies, although those public health studies have an explicit longitudinal component, which I want to be very clear we do not have here. We have repeated cross-sections. Um, these are standard difference and differences models where we're going to look at a range of outcomes for kid or adult I in province P at time T as a function of the time, these province specific mental bands, which vary by province and time. These um, uh, individuals characteristics, which vary uh, depending on whether we're looking at the youth or the adult data. These province time varying factors, such as the unemployment rate, the real cigarette price, and the e-cigarette minimum legal sale age, province fixed effects, and time fixed effects. So time is going to be like year dummies, which will control for all national specific Canadian shocks. Province specific dummies will control for anything time invariant about that makes Ontario different from Quebec, etc. Okay, so let me just show you the uh, regressions underlying the raw data that I just showed you previously. So this is in a slightly different order, but um, menthol bans did not significantly affect overall smoking. So I'm showing you the in each of these is from a separate regression. I'm showing you the coefficient on the province specific menthol ban in a regression where the outcome is ever smoked 100 cigarettes or more in your life, any cigarette smoking in the past 30 days, did you ever try to quit among smokers? I'm showing you the effect for kids and the effect for adults. So we chose outcomes here that are common in both the kids survey and the adult survey. And what you see overall is that there's no, and I'm sorry I didn't say this, these are not standard errors, these are p-values from um, uh, 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 a method that adjusts for the small number of clusters given the small number of provinces in Canada. So what you see here is that there is no uh, economically or statistically, there's certainly for kids, there's no economically or statistically significant effect on overall smoking in terms of these first handful of measures of uh, whether you smoked at all. For adults, we find no um, statistically significant, uh, excuse me, notwithstanding one strange thing that we cannot explain here, which we think is uh, a noisy fluke in the data, we do not find statistically significant reductions in, for example, the likelihood of any cigarette smoking in the past 30 days. Um, uh, this is just the picture I showed you before on overall youth cigarette smoking. So when you put that in a difference in differences framework, excuse me, in an event study framework, you see this kind of coincident with the adoption of bans, you don't see any change in significant or economically or statistically significant change in kids smoking. Uh, for adults, again, we have a much longer time series. When you put that in a difference in differences framework or an event study framework, you see no strong evidence of differential pretrends. You do see a sizable uh, point estimate in the post period, but it's not statistically significant. Um, for uh, So this is what I just showed you for the main sample. If the bonus slide here is if we extend this period past 2019, uh, using two more waves of recent data and also um, code everyone after 2018 is subject to a ban. So again, here are the estimates for kids in our published paper. Here are the estimates for kids through 2019. You see no change in punchline. So it's not something unique about our sample period in the published work. If you extend this all the way up to 2019, it does not change the punchline either for kids or for adults. Um, again, the main result of our paper uh, to highlight is that uh, cigarettes, uh, menthol cigarette smoking significantly fell. So these are the pictures that I showed you on menthol cigarette smoking. Here's the event study. That corresponds with a 2.4 percentage point reduction in kid menthol smoking, a 3.1 percentage point reduction in adult menthol smoking. Those are all statistically significant. You can look at other measures of menthol smoking in the adult data. They're, they all show significant reductions. Um, given time, I'm not going to um, uh, have uh, the time to show you the sales data. Um, here's a really interesting picture from one of the Chaitan studies looking at sales data in Ontario versus British Columbia. What we did is we got that sales data for every province over, t over a more recent period. You see the same pattern. So that just confirms uh, that Chaitan uh, study. You see some evidence of stockpiling prior to provincial and um, uh, 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 federal bans, but uh, the punchline is still the same. You see this huge reduction in menthol sales and no concomitant uh, uh, offsetting in, in the non-menthol sales. Um, and then finally, I'll just show you the regression estimates for these uh, substitution and evasion effects. Um, so the substitution effect here is that kit, when you look at non-menthol cigarette smoking by kids, uh, provincial bans are associated with a 1.7 percentage point increase in the likelihood that kids smoke non-menthol cigarettes. That's the picture. That's the event study. 
Again, uh, there's some evidence of differential pretrends, but you see in the post period uh, uh, an increase in, in, in non menthol cigarette use. And then for adults, you don't see that increase in non menthol cigarette use, but you do see uh, more purchasing on First Nations reserves and less purchasing on kind of grocery stores that are off of First Nations reserve. So uh, the punchline here is that um, menthol bans uh, in Canada worked and didn't work. So they worked to reduce menthol smoking, which was for sure a big intended effect, but they also had some unintended effects. So they induced substitution to non-menthol cigs for youth, and they induced evasion to unregulated sources. And so all of this is just to say, this, I don't, we don't think this should be that surprising, but it does suggest that there are going to be some challenges and that menthol cigarette bans are unlikely to be a panacea. And with that, I thank you for your attention and for your questions and hand it back over to Mike. Um. Okay, how about we do just a couple questions and then we'll do a uh, discuss and uh, uh, comments uh, quick, sure. just to clear a few things that that were outstanding. Um, uh, uh, Ken Warner, he, he's wondering, um, uh, similar to my question previously, what do you make of the very large decrease in control provinces mm -hmm. purchases on First uh, Nation reserves? Uh, yeah, so that I, I agree. That's a great question. Um, let me just get to it so that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about this. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. That's a very good question. Uh, and uh, again, what I would say is, although I don't know about what's driving that, um, what I can say, and I, I'm not saying that Ken is disputing this, but what I can say is that the, the trends leading up to the, the imposition of the provincial bans are quite similar. So there must have been something different um, that happened in the um, um, non, non adopting places that did not happen in the adopting places. We would say that the main different thing is that they didn't have these very strong incentives, uh, but that doesn't answer the question about what would have drawn, what would have uh, led to, and this is an incorrectly scaled axis, I apologize, obviously that's incorrectly scaled, what would have led to that significant drop. So um, I, I can jump in here if he has ideas, but I don't know, um, I don't have a great answer for that question. Um, and do you think that, uh, um, I mean, you, you speculate one mechanism through which people may have continued getting their menthol cigarettes was through First Nation reserves. Um, I don't know if, you, if there's might be data on other potential mechanisms, such as like, I've heard you can get these flavoring cards that you put into the cigarette packs that mentholate uh, uh, the cigarettes, if the flavoring cards in the cigarette pack for an hour. Uh, there's, I've heard there's drops of menthol flavoring. Is any of, are those kind of products available in sales data at all? Um, that's a great question that I should be able to answer better than me, but they were, they, whether or not they were available in sales data, they were also banned as part of the menthol ban, those flavorings. So okay. those, those should not have been available on the market, but you're right that like, it would be great to know if we could get, for example, this for the products you just described to see if those also fell. Um, cause I do not think that they are included here. Let me also be clear that first nations purchases are not included in these official sales data. Um, but as to your question, I agree, that would be really interesting if we could get those data as well. Right. And then in the survey data, you don't have any other, or you don't have any other measures of like intensity of, of use. Um, I, I think I was seeing kind of like 30 day use and maybe quit intentions. Sales data nicely gets at the, you know, more granular kind of information. But in the survey data, there aren't other questions that might get at like the, you know, the number of uh, cigarettes smoked per month or anything like that? There are data on the number of cigarettes smoked. Um, we cannot get it separately by menthol versus non-menthol, um, but you, but we have looked at that. And overall for kids, we find no significant change. If I remember right, I can correct me if that's wrong. Um, uh, I cannot remember what we found for adults, um, but we can't get that by menthol versus non-menthol. So the, the extensive margin is the only thing we can get for menthol versus non-menthol for kids and for adults. Okay. All right, let's kick it over to the, um, to the discussion and other people feel free to add your questions to the Q&A and then we're gonna go back to Kit after discussing comments for further questions. So um, am I on, uh, Mike? Uh, not yet. Um, share screen. Uh, let me see how I can get this. Uh, sorry. The bottom of the uh, Zoom, there should be a share, share screen. screen. Okay, that'll, that'll take me to my share screen, won't it? Mm -hmm. should. Okay, here we are. I think I'm good. Can you Great. see this? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, so um, uh, congratulations, by the way, on getting this paper accepted. I didn't know that it was accepted before, uh, before reading it uh, yesterday. And um, this paper is, it attacks a problem that is really interesting and it's a really difficult question too. And that's, I think, why the authors uh, got so many different viewpoints on. They got time series data, cross-section data for young people, for old people. And it's, it's, it's a really challenging thing to do. And they've done an enormous amount of work on it and, pre and presented some really interesting results. Uh, my disclosure is that um, uh, Kit's co-author, Hein Nguyen, is a co-author of mine, but that's not going to stop me from saying what I want to say. Um, I'm just going to concentrate on one slide in your paper kit, and, and that is a set of diagrams for the individual provinces, and maybe this is fortuitous because you didn't spend a lot of time on this. I find this an extraordinarily interesting uh, slide. I've taken these five provinces data from the time series from uh, the, the back of your paper, and these are trends in menthol sales. Now, I've taken five provinces here. The bottom three only have a federal ban, and that is indicated by the timing of that is indicated by the, federal, by the vertical line. There are Manitoba, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, and then to compare them, I took Alberta and Ontario, which have a provincial ban as well. Now, the, on the bottom three uh, panels, what you observe before the federal ban comes in is an enormous uptake in sales, and you mentioned this in your paper. And effectively what happened in these provinces for about 15 months before the ban came in was on average, menthol sales doubled. Now, this is an extraordinary <laughs> increase in menthol sales. If you hadn't told me this, as, and knowing what Michael Chaton had in his paper, I would have guessed that sales would have gone up for two or three months before the, um, the actual ban came in. So this is, first of all, an enormous increase in inventory that's going to go forward in time after the ban has come into, into effect. The second thing about this is that the, the increase in inventories took place at exactly the same time in all of these different provinces. And if you look at the time that they came in, you also have a very informative chart in the appendix in your paper, and you give the date of the first and second and final readings of the different bills in the different parliaments and in the federal government. So the start of the buildup, if you look at the chart there, you'll see it's, ex it's just exactly June of 2016, and that was the first reading of the federal bill. Uh, Ontario and Alberta don't have, even though Ontario, and at least one of these had a much earlier first reading of their bill, but you don't see any build up in inventories at the time the first reading in the province. So the build up is extraordinarily large and it coincides, um, and, they, and the build ups, the start of the build ups all coincide time wise. So the fact that they all coincide time wise um, probably opens up a scope for a political economy kind of paper here, because you know in macroeconomics where there's all this announcement literature, before you do anything, if you announce it, you'll induce, uh, you'll induce counter behavior to what you really want to have. So um, it, there's probably an interesting political economy paper to be written on these, on these data, uh, given that you've explored everything else about them. And uh, the, the other thing is that um, when you come to the data in the post-ban period, it, it must be the case that if we're carrying forward a year's worth of inventory, that individuals in the post-ban period, for the most part, are not forced to make a decision as to whether they're going to continue smoking uh, menthol or whether they're going to uh, switch over to the non-menthol regular cigarettes because there's a year's worth of inventory there. So in a, in a way, the decision, you know, the, the decision that individuals are going to make, let me see if I can get my draw pen here. Uh, sorry. Okay, so um, if we've got a year's worth of inventories here, a year's worth here, and then we come to the smoking behavior, the menthol smoking behavior of individuals, they're going to take all this period here to, to run down that inventory, and they're only going to really come to terms with a, a choice for the most of them about one year after the ban comes into effect. So, so uh, really what we would like to be able to do, I suppose, is to compare this here with whatever happens over here, and because we've got a whole, a whole load of noise in, in, in the middle. But if you just look at sales of non-menthol cigarettes in the period immediately after the ban, given the huge amount of inventory out there, it's, prob it's um, those, those, um, sales of non-menthol cigarettes would be understating dramatically the total amount of cigarettes consumed because people are consuming out of inventory. Anyway, enough said. Um, so there's, there's it, it, 
It may also be the case that the supply side, the manufacturers of cigarettes, uh, conspired or cooperated with the retailers and wholesalers and maybe they warned them and said you know these bands are going to come in a year down the road you better start making orders from us and so they pushed the sale of uh, menthol cigarettes very hard in the year preceding the actual date of the implementation of the ban so there's lots of interesting stuff to explore here the only other the other comment i would like to make is in relation to um oh <laughs> Get it published soon. I'll get to that comment in a moment or two. <laughs> uh, I want to say something about, uh, Mike mentioned about uh, mint and menthol cards. Uh, over the last couple of years, there are things called crush balls on the market. And so crush balls are tiny little capsules about the size of a peppercorn. And you can buy about a thousand of these. You can buy online a month's supply of these crush balls for about the price of a packet of cigarettes. The way these things work is that you take your regular cigarette, I'm, I'm imagining I have a cigarette here. This is a, a rolled up napkin from my coffee this morning. And so you can imagine it's a cigarette. And what they do with the capsules is that they take the filter end and they just put a little hole in it using a paper clip or a cocktail stick or a pencil. Take one of these peppercorn si sized capsules, stuff it in there, put it in, and then they squeeze the filter and you get this explosion of menthol flavor. So you can turn a regular cigarette now into a menthol cigarette in about 10 seconds. And it costs very, very little. This may not be relevant for people who are accustomed to driving to First Nations Indian, uh, Indian uh, First Nation reserves to buy sort of illegal cigarettes. But the fact that this new technology has come along is, I, I think, more evidence of the likelihood of substitution on the part, especially of the younger generation, who is, um, which is very much attuned to the internet. Because rather than getting in your car and driving to First Nations and doing some substitution, uh, all you have to do is spend three minutes on the internet and a, a month's supply of, um, of crushed balls uh, arrives on your doorstep uh, the following morning. And so anybody who's interested in this area, I really advise get on YouTube, spend 20 minutes on YouTube and find out what's happening with uh, crushed balls. And my, my take from Kit and High's paper is that if people are willing to substitute when it's hard to substitute, right? You have to drive to the First Nations Reserve, then they're going to be more willing to substitute when it's easy to substitute. And we have to think about all of this stuff as we uh, uh, move forward. I've said here, Michael Chaton is an expert on legal crush balls. Um, and just a, a slight point of correction to the discussion that made, was made earlier on, the manufacturers of menthol cigarettes, I believe in Canada for a period of time, just before the federal ban came in, were legally, um, putting these little crush balls into their cigarettes and then individuals had the option of activating by squeezing the filter. But then they were ultimately uh, made illegal and so they were taken off the market by the legal suppliers. Um, so the, my last comment was get it published soon because um, there are not a lot of kids in Canada who are daily smokers um, and who are uh, smoking uh, menthol flavors, but of course there's a huge uh, percentage of kids in the U.S., particularly African Americans, and the interesting thing about that market, of course, is that they're consuming most of their menthol, if I have it correct, uh, through cigars and cigarillos. Is, isn't that the case? It's not through cigarettes. So it'd be interesting to interpret all of these, these results that you get in relation to what might happen when you transfer, transfer the product. Well, I suppose e-cigarettes is just another case. So there you are, that's my impression. I really enjoyed the paper, a huge load of work, so congratulations. Ian, if I can just ask you a quick question. Uh, do, you, do you know anything about if these crush balls are sold on a black market in Canada currently, even if they're not legal? I, I do not know. I, I know you'll get them very easily on Alibaba, and I, and I really don't know whether they'll arrive the next day or whether they'll, they'll, take, they'll take a week. But um, if you just type in crush balls, um, sounds like something that Margaret Thatcher would have thought of, but it's not. They're just these little things that you put into uh, cigarette filters. And um, my, my impression is that they're, they're quite easy to get. I do not know to what extent they are being used. Um, maybe the kids have all just migrated over to menthol and e-cigarettes and so that they're not a huge thing in the market. And really what I'm saying here is that if people were to choose to stay cigarettes and they wanted to smoke menthol, then it would be very, it would be easy to, to get this stuff. I don't, and I, I 
I don't know enough about you know the the legal status of these things, but my guess is that if you go online, all you need is a credit card. You don't there's no age verification or anything like that. You just order them and they and they arrive. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, please stop sharing your screen. Um, okay. And uh, Kit, uh, do any uh, responses to the discussion comments? Um, otherwise, we have a few remaining questions that we can go through. Um, no, my response is just thank you. That was really helpful and insightful, and thank you for the correction. Um, and uh, you're right, there's a lot more interesting political economy angles that we should think about and look into. Okay. Um, one remaining question in the Q&A. Um, uh, sales data looks super interesting. In some of the graphs, it looks like sales increased quite a bit before the policy. I'd interpret this as some anticipatory behavior. Was the policy expected? I think Ian talked about this a little bit as well, but curious for your take on it. Yep, my take is the same as Ian's. I mean, there's clearly anticipatory behavior um, going on that appears to be associated with the announcement that the federal policy was coming. Um, so we are going to, you know, for us, uh, it's not going to uh, screw up our difference in differences estimate, but it is certainly an interesting um, pattern that jumps out from the sales data for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. In the um, in the chat, uh, a question from one of the organizers. Um, do you also consider the possibility that menthol smokers may purchase online or travel to control states provinces where menthol cigarettes are not banned? And what implications think, would that have to your difference in difference yeah, I think modeling? That's a fantastic question. Um, almost surely some of that is going on. Uh, we can't measure that in the data because the survey didn't ask about kind of did you buy online? Did you cross uh, the only kind of other unregulated source that asked was about First Nations, at least that, that I can remember. Um, so we can't um, kind of directly address that. I do think that if anything, that just biases our estimates of the band down because it will kind of dilute the um, uh, estimated effects of, of the policy. I will say that if you think about, well, one thing about Canada is that it's big uh, and travel is costly. Uh, so, you know, many of the places are very far away, um, but some of them are not so far away from an unregulated place. So I think that, you know, the physical travel distance is, 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 is definitely a plausible thing. I will say that this kind of cross US Canada border is much less likely given the very harsh uh, and strict uh, regulations at the border for, um, uh, importing um, tobacco across country lines. Um, the other thing I'll say about, um, even though we don't have direct measures of things like online, et cetera, um, the other uh, result that I will point out is that is in the paper is that uh, we do know urban versus rural status. Um, and while it is not true that Native American, res excuse me, First Nations reserves are only in rural places, um, they are disproportionately in rural places. And we do find that the rural folks are more likely to do First Nations purchasing in provinces that have bans after the bans are adopted relative to otherwise similar urban folks, which is consistent with um, uh, uh, First Nations reserve purchasing being important for those adults. Uh, we also find less change in their overall uh, menthol smoking, which again is not surprising since they're probably still smoking menthols, they're just smoking menthols that they purchased from unregulated sources. Okay, and uh, uh, Q&A is cleared. If you wanted to address anything else that was um, answered previously by your co-author, uh, that's fine. Otherwise, um, I'll yeah, kick it over to Justin. Right. Sure. Let me just take a quick, um, you know, uh, I think Jody Sindelar and others have asked about, um, uh, you know, effects on vaping and that kind of thing. Um, and so those are really interesting and important questions. Uh, the We don't observe the flavor in the vaping, um, but we do observe whether or not you used e-cigarettes in the past 30 days. And so these are the point estimates on the ban, on the provincial ban in those diff and diff regressions where the outcome again is, did you use e-cigarettes um, in the past 30 days? And so what you find is um, this, you know, you don't find substitution to e-cigarettes. If anything, you find evidence of complementarity. You see reductions in e-cigarette use for the adults coincident with the adoption of uh, menthol bans. Um, so I think that addresses um, Jody's question. And let me just see if there was anything else that I thought worth saying. You know, there, uh, just to pile on, there are a variety of really good questions about um, kind of the similarity of the treatment in the control provinces. Um, it, you know, what I would say is that there are only so many provinces in Canada, they are quite different if you're familiar with Canada. So we can only do so much in terms of 
um, uh, um, kind of matching on um, similar backgrounds. But we have controlled for as many characteristics as we can. And also, we've just shown you the raw data. So for many of the outcomes, you can just see that, notwithstanding that I don't have a great answer to Mike's or Ken's question about what was going on in those control provinces, there is something coincident with the menthol bands that makes the outcomes for the people in the menthol band provinces look different in the post period than the people in the non menthol band provinces. And of course, our preferred uh, explanation is that it was the bands. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Okay, great. I'll kick it over to Justin then for to wrap up. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carpenter for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 146 people for your participation. Thanks again for participating and have a tops notch weekend. Thank you, everyone.